My name is Ricardo Cruciani. I'm the Vice Chair of the Department of uh, Pain Medicine and Palliative Care here at Bedisbro New York Medical Center, and I'm the Director of the Pain Division and Associate Professor in Neurology. And today what we're going to do is trying to uh, talk about uh, how do you design a clinical trial, what are the things that go into your mind when you go through that process, and what is the impact that the placebo effect can have on the results that you are willing to get. So the, the, the first slide is going to address the issue of evidence-based medicine, and the reason is because that's what exactly what we are trying to do. That's what we are attempting, that when you leave the fellowship, this is the way you think. You have to become critical thinkers because there is a lot of uh, literature out there, and uh, sometimes the information there can be misleading. So the uh, way that you select the data is going to have a direct impact on the way that you treat the patients. So what is interesting, though, is that if I would ask you, what do you think that is evidence-based medicine, and I wouldn't have shown you the next sentence that I did, then many people would have said perhaps that it's having a randomized clinical trial, because that's what comes to your mind, something that is well designed, that is good, that you can get data, that the data can support conclusions. But the reality is that evidence-based medicine is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of the best current evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. So the evidence-based medicine will become then the best <coughs> evidence that you have at that point. Let's say it's a new field and there is no a single clinical trial, there is no meta-analysis, there is no high level of evidence there. Well, your, your uh, evidence-based medicine will be based what? On anecdotal findings, right? But that would be the best that you have at that point. So what you try to do eventually is to get more data and increase the level of evidence to have a better evidence-based medicine. That, that is the goal and that's the process that you go through. So the palliative care should embrace the tenets of uh, evidence-based medicine. And the reason why we have this slide here, because it really is a new science that we have. It's a new field. It's growing slowly. And if you go to the palliative care meetings, you will see that there is a lot of information that is based on impressions, on clinical experience, and uh, slowly, but still very poor amount of data that are based on more sophisticated type of trials, like a randomized placebo-controlled trial. So, but this is the goal, this is what we are heading. And the reason is because if you don't do it that way, then you end up with statements like this. Mm -hmm. As we know, there are known knowns, there are things we know we know, we also know there are known unknowns, that is to say, we know there are some things we do not know but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones that we don't know, we don't know. So we need better <laughs> evidence than this in order to uh, answer some of the questions that we, that we want us to treat the patients better, right? So, and this would be another example of uh, the, uh, where the field is. And I'm using an example of opioids because it's something that we are very familiar and we use all the time. So we can say that there is consensus on opioid therapy as a first line for severe acute pain. And if we look at the level of the evidence, the evidence will be high. We have many, many studies, and there is consistency among them. If you look at the literature, you will find meta-analysis that take the best studies, and they uh, come up with that particular outcome that I just mentioned. There is also consensus that opioid therapy is the first line for moderate to severe chronic pain related to cancer and advanced medical illness of any type, based also in this type of studies. But there is no consensus on the use of opioid therapy for chronic non-cancer pain. Why is that there is no consensus? Well, the reason why there is no consensus is because of the level of the evidence is not yet there. What I'm showing you here is opioids for the treatment of chronic non-cancer pain, which is one of the controversial issues. Why is it controversial? Because if you look at the data, we have meta-analysis of RCTs that are, that are done with weak opioids, and then we have with intermediates or more potent opioids. 41 RCTs, randomized controlled trials, have been done, and we have 6,000 patients um, altogether. 
Of these 6,000 patients, 80% have nociceptive pain, 12% neuropathic pain, 7% fibromyalgia, and then we have mixed pain in the rest of them. But the duration of these trials is five weeks, right? And it ranges from just one week to 16 weeks. That means that they are short trials. Opioids outperform placebo for pain and functional outcomes in nociceptive and neuropathic pain and fibromyalgia. The strong opioids were superior to naproxen and nortriptyline, but opioids outperform placebo for pain and function in all types of pains. Other drugs produce better functional outcomes than opioids, but strong opioids better for pain relief. So this is the only thing that you can say after you looked at data from 6,000 patients. This is the only thing that you can say with, with certain level of certainty. Now, look at this. This is opioids for neuropathic pain. So what is the level of the evidence? So what we have here is 23. If you go one, two, three, the third line, 23 trials, most short terms, hours to days, hours to days. Nine intermediate uh, term trials with median duration of 28 days. Short term trials have contradictory results. Intermediate term trials demonstrated opioid efficacy. And then we have meta-analysis for the intermediate term trials, studies that show efficacy. But then if you have this level of evidence, what is that you can say? Well, what you can say is that in intermediate term studies demonstrate efficacy of opioids over placebo, long-term efficacy and safety are unknown. So this is where we are. That's why there is so much controversy about it. And that's why you have to be very careful when you treat these patients and you have to go through a process of eliminating other alternatives to treatment when you decide to embark in this type of therapy because the level of evidence, evidence for patients treated long-term with opioids is not that strong. So this is what it helped us then again to see where we are on evidence-based medicine and how we go through the process of thinking on how to design the studies that we need to do. So we have to focus on the quality of the evidence and then the strength of the recommendation. So at the end of the day, when we get together and we say, okay, we're going to make recommendations, what do we do with the opioids? Who do we treat? How do we treat them? So what we are going to have is qualifiers on the statements. Why? Because the level of the evidence can be different for different statements that we make. Next to the, to, this, to the statement, we need to have the quality of evidence, and we have to say what is the quality of the evidence, and the strength of the recommendation. So the strength of the recommendation will vary depending on this, the particular statement we're making is based on a meta-analysis or several meta-analysis as compared <coughs> to clinical experience. So that's why we, we have to be critical. Like, for example, the 2007 paper by the American Pain Society that put together with the APM, where they looked at the use of opioids for non-cancer pain, and they were focusing also on drug issues or diversion, et cetera, et cetera. So if you go through that paper, really it's terrific, and I think that one of the reasons why it's terrific is because it really puts you into the context of where the level of the knowledge is. And it helps you then when you see a statement, to go back to that paper and you say, well, what was the level of the recommendation here? What was the level of the evidence? Why am I doing this? Why are they recommending this? So this is the way that I think that, that we have to think about um, all this stuff. And this is a little bit of the same, and we move on and we uh, get to the pyramid of evidence, which is a slide that I like very much. And the reason why I like it, it is because I went from down here uh, that I, I started, like, I want to say 30 years ago, and I ended up somewhere <laughs> around here. So it is interesting, right? So some people devote all their lives down here, making incredible contributions. Some people make a mix of the two, and so forth. So the level of evidence helps us uh, to see where we are again when, when you look at, at, at certain statements, how were they obtained. So, ideally, what we want to do is to get here, right? So, to be able to do a meta-analysis. How do you do a meta-analysis? Well, you get all the studies that you have available, you put them together, and you analyze them together. The problem with that is that if you have bad studies and you put them together, you are going to have bad outcomes. Bad studies won't make a good meta-analysis and good outcomes. We will be just bad, bad outcomes. So, what you do is you clean the data. So let's say you have 200 
200 studies about long-term opioid use. And then you start looking at the studies one by one. And then you realize that one of the studies has four patients. Well, you're not going to use that study, right? So before you do that selection, you're going to put certain parameters. Then you look at the duration of the study. Well, these studies, 90% of these studies were only two weeks. Well, well you are looking at, at the long term. So really, these are not good studies. So by the end of the day, sometimes you end up with one, two, three studies. So you, in, in occasions, you can't even do a meta-analysis because you don't have sufficient data. And this is what it will be, again, a qualifier to the level of the evidence that you do. But also, it depends then where you are here that is the type of questions that you are going to ask, right? If you are, uh, have some evidence in vitro that something is going on that you find interesting, you are not going to do, as the next step, a meta-analysis, obviously. You are going to do some animal research, then maybe you are going to do a case series then, or report a case series, then you are going to do a prospective study, perhaps, and then you are going to move to a control trial. And then when you have several of those, perhaps you are going to do a meta-analysis. So the, the question is, is very important, and the question will be, determined by the level of evidence that you have at a particular time. 